1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. You know, we kind of went to verse 7 the last time, and so starting at verse 8, Paul again reminds us for the need to be self-controlled. He's talking to the believers in Thessalonica, and he's speaking to us today to be self-controlled. <laughs> one of the greatest examples, one of the greatest testimonies to our maturity in faith is our ability to be self-controlled, to control our tongue to control our mind, to control our actions, our attitudes, because they're grounded in Christ. Good morning, Ray. Yeah, appreciate the uh, continued prayers. Mom's recovery, uh, it's going to be quite a few weeks um, for her. And we had family coming at Thanksgiving and at Christmas, and uh, um, she likes to host. So it, it's going to be an interesting uh, season for her, for sure. Good morning, Pat. So we're called to be self-controlled. We're to be vigilant. We're to be on guard like soldiers. Remember, this is one of the first, uh, the first book that we have from Paul. And so you can see some of his later theology, right? The, uh, um, the whole uh, armor of God that is given to us in another book. But it's starting to come out here. You know, it's this faith and love will protect vital vital organs, right? They're protecting the hearts and the lungs, and we have the hope of salvation that protects our head, and he's beginning to kind of picture that armor of God that we'll later see in its entirety. You know, we receive Christ with faith and love and hope for heaven. That's the biggest part. You know, in Scripture, we are told often that we are not citizens of this world, right? Our citizenship is in heaven. Our hope is in heaven. It's not in today. It's not in the now. It's in the future, the heaven, our heavenly home with Jesus. You know, salvation, as Paul's talking here, is hope is found. And, you know, as the old song said, that the hope of salvation is found in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Good morning, Jen. Thank you. You know, God saves through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. It was Jesus who died for us. And, and, and I want you to think this, you know, that we're coming up on, um, this is the final week of voting Next week is the actual final voting day, and uh, um, you know maybe you've already voted, and that doesn't matter. This isn't a call that you have to vote, but I want you to think about something with me here. Jesus lived in a time that was extremely polarized. It was extremely polarized, very political. Uh, politics had even entered into the church, and that's a topic for uh, another day. But on the spectrum with Jesus, you could think of 
the the one end of the spectrum were the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the uh, the chief priests. They were the leading aristocrats. By the way, they only believed in the first five books of the Bible. They didn't believe in anything else. They threw the rest of it out. It was only the books of Mor Moses. So here they are, the chief priests. They're the leading aristocrats in the area. They were all based in Jerusalem. They were wealthy. They were powerful. They controlled the temple worship all the priests and the teachers of the law were under the Sadducees. They, re they, they represented the main line of Judaism in the day. And one of the things, you know, we've said that they're sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. You know, on the other end of the spectrum, you had the, the Pharisees. The Pharisees were, the, the, were zealous and they were a popular renewal movement. Um, they wanted to renew Judaism. They were seeking to purify Israel from the contamination of the Romans and, and other cultures that had seeped in, right? Because God had said, you will have no other gods before me, but you let the Romans in. And now you have cult, uh, imperial worship and all of this. And they were, they were concerned and they wanted to cleanse God's people so that God, the Messiah, would come again. They were, they were waiting on the return of the Messiah, and they missed it. They were a very strict, perfectionist, legalist group. What started out as the seekers of holiness in their day became very legalistic. You have another group in there, the Herodians, that Jesus says in Mark, you know, to look out for the yeast of the Sadducees and Pharisees, and he adds in the Herodians as well. The Herodians were Jewish believers who were in the party of Herod. They were in the political party of Herod. They had aligned themselves with Herod, who had killed the babies, right? And his son, Herod. And uh, you can just go through the history of the multiple Herods at that time. They were the Herodians. They were very political because they saw power. There were three other groups in those days as well. One was the Zealots. The Zealots were very zealous. And in fact, they believed in the power of the sword. Um, we see a lot of them written in the Apocrypha and the Maccabees. Um, the Zealots were constantly warring against Rome. They were an uprising that had happened not long before uh, Jesus's trial with Pilate, and that's what he was worried about, was another uprising of the zealots. Good morning, Robert. And then there's the Essenes. The Essenes were a group of people who they felt that they needed to uh, um, leave all society. They went out into the deserts, and they lived basically as monks to purify themselves. There are a lot of um, philosophers, theologies, uh, theologists that believe that John the Baptist had joined in the Essenes and was living out in the desert with them and then coming and preaching. That he had taken on this, this theology of separation from the world, complete separation from the world. And the final group, you could call them, well, they were the assimilators. They were the compromisers, like Matthew and Levi, or, or Levi. Uh, Matthew, who was the tax collector, right? He was a Jew who had, well, he had disowned his uh, Jewish nature, uh, who he was, and had become a tax collector. He had joined in with the Romans, not just the Herodian J ruling Jewish party, but the Romans themselves. You see, Jesus lived in a very polarized time, just like we do today. <clears throat> and in the midst of that polarization, he has quite a bit to show us and to share with us. You know, when we look through some of the miracles that Jesus did, the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, the calming of the water and the boat. It, it was not about showing his power. It was about saying, I am enough. I am enough. When he asked the disciples, you feed them, and they didn't know what to do, he goes, I'm enough. When they argued about in the boat about the bread and what did that mean in the yeast of the Pharisees and Jesus said, I am with you. 
I'm here. I'm all you need. I am enough. You know, we as believers follow a crucified Jesus. That was not a popular thing in the day, right? You weren't seeking to be crucified. Only the worst of the worst. It was a curse. And here's what I, I think we can gather from this. Jesus was standing before Pilate, and Pilate asked the crowd, who do you want to be freed? There were two individuals of that day. Do you realize that the real, in, in the Greek, it's Jesus Barabbas and Jesus of Nazareth. There were two Jesuses standing there that day. The crowd wanted Jesus Barabbas, who was ad admired for fighting the government. He was popular. He was what you would consider a patriot and a nationalist in those days. He was fighting the Romans, even to the point of being a scoundrel and a murderer, depending on which book, which gospel you look at. Some say he was a murderer. Some of one, Another one says he, raised, he, he was leading an insurrection, but he was admired. And then you have Jesus of Nazareth. He wasn't building up a violent group to take over the government of the day. He was passive, waiting on the kingdom of God to arrive. When accused, he made no reply. Like a lamb... Right? Uh, read through the Gospels on that. He believed in the supernatural power of God to ensure that God's plan would always prevail. He had hope in God's plan, not a earthly plan. And, and so the challenge for us as believers today is who will bring you peace? Who brings you hope? A trial for every generation is which Jesus do we choose? Do we choose Jesus Barabbas who will make something happen right now? Or do we choose Jesus of Nazareth who is hopeful and waiting on God's kingdom to arrive. Which of these two do we choose? Pilate asked the crowd, which do you choose? And they cried out, Barabbas. And he said, what do I do with this Jesus of Nazareth? And they said, crucify him. And he then responds, you would have me crucify your king. In their response, these Jews, these Pharisees cried out, and Sadducees, and they all cried out. They said, we have no king but Caesar. Rewind back to the days of Israel being led by God, and they decided they wanted a king like all other nations. And they were warned, it won't go well with you. Good morning, Mom. But they chose Barabbas and the man of Saul to be their king. History tells us that the tendency of us as God's people is to choose sometimes even violent solutions and violent leaders against our pagan culture and rather than follow Jesus who seems weak. Now that is not a meant to be a political telling you how to vote. What I want to get across is where our hope lies in God's plan the one who says that he puts all authorities over us whether 
Trump wins or Biden wins, God is still in control. Whether there's a conservative power and control in the House and Senate or in the Supreme Court or not, God is still in control. He is still on the throne. He, the one who died for you, is still in control. He promises to return, and we can believe it. We can hope in that. We can hold fast to that. But that doesn't mean that we hold still in that, right? There's no excuse for coasting in our growth, in our spiritual maturity, there's no cruise control in faith. We must encourage one another. The emphasis there is on a mutual encouragement. We must build one another up. These both are continuous, ongoing verbs that don't stop. We don't do it once. We don't do it when we feel like it. We are to always encourage and build one another up, even if we don't agree. <laughs> Unity. I love the Phillips translation here. It says, so go on cheering and strengthening each other. Who are you cheering and who are you strengthening in God? Every one of us has something to contribute to encourage and build one another up. It's a call for a mutual ministry within the body of Christ. It's not selfish seeking to only take or to only give, but it's mutual. Mutual trust mutual love and a God who was a crucified God. He didn't come as the people of the day expected. He didn't come as a knight on a horse. He came as a king of peace on a donkey. but we know that one day he will come again as that conquering king to redeem and restore. In the day of the Lord, he'll come. And are we hopeful? Our focus on that or is our focus on a temporary? You know, I have, let me put it into a sports term here, because politics, I'll, I'll tell you the one thing, if I ever, when I post anything that seems even slightly political, it is the one thing that I get lamblasted for. I get called out on. And it's not just a message, a private message of questioning. It's public everywhere because politics people get I, I would never do this but I, I i venture to guess that there are um comments that i could make about the trinity that would get less scrutinized i i could say i was a cessationalist that i don't believe that miracles happen and that's not true because i do believe miracles happen but i, I could say that and people would not blink an eye. But if I say anything seemingly political, I get lamb blasted. Because our identity and our hope is found too securely sometimes in the now. In a Jesus Barabbas who will get something done. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't be passionate about that. It doesn't mean that we don't uh, get passionate for what we believe. I, I am strong pro-life, all life. 
That includes prison reform. That includes immigration reform. That includes the unborn baby. That includes matters of death penalty. That includes orphan care, widow care. I'm all for taking care of the poor. I'm all about foreign policy because how we treat others is how they will treat us. It's okay to be passionate for those things. But we remember that my hope does not hinge on what happens next week. My hope is found in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other grounds, political, all other grounds, temporary, all other grounds are sinking sand. So my challenge and challenge to myself is how do I love God and love others more even in the areas where I'm passionate? How do I learn to dialogue more? How do I learn to trust God's plan and guidance in all things. Heavenly Father, we just ask that in this time, we, we live in a day and age that just turn on the news is being ripped apart. The attacks Running for political office is not as professional, <laughs> in a way. It, it, there's not as much courtesy. There's not as much mutual respect. And that's not just this time. It's been happening for a while, and it, it creates in a younger generation a lack of respect for those that don't agree with them. And that is not to be the way of the cross. That's not to be the way of the believer who should seek to love everyone regardless of their political views. God, I, I think about when you stood before <laughs> the nation of Israel and they, the angel of the Lord was there and in front of Joshua and he said, whose side are you on? And he said, the angel said, neither. And I think sometimes we put you in a box of one polit political side or another and you are not in either box. Or better to say you are in both. <laughs> Because you're in your creation. And God, while there are things that I strongly believe are biblically important, biblically mandated that show how I vote, I understand that there are some others who due to that same biblical passion in other areas as well as the decision on which items can effective be affected quicker policies change and sometimes it leads them to vote differently than I do Lord may I never ever 
in my heart say anything hurtful, hateful against someone who you've created. How often I've heard, how can you be a Christian and vote? See that in Facebook lately from, and it hurts. God, I thank you for the way you've made us all passionate about certain things. For some, it's a pro-life. For some, it's a pro-immigrant. For some, it's pro-policy uh, and foreign affairs and it, whatever it might be, God, that for whatever reason, you have built us that way. God, may we see you above and beyond and not go the way of history. You see too often in history the church being defined by one political party and led to things like the Crusades, the wars of Ireland, Kosovo, Rwanda. There but by the grace of God go I. In self-control and humility, Lord, May we seek to follow you and how we choose to vote. Heavenly Father, we thank you. God, continue to work in us. May the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts be pleasing unto you. We'll give you all the praise. We'll give you all the glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, go in peace. Good morning, Loretta. Hope you have a great day.